Hello everyone, first things first, before I get into the meat of this video, Subscribestar is now actually definitely properly working for me. So if you think Patreon can eat a bag of dicks, but you still want to support me, you can now do so via Subscribestar. And I need a certain minimum number of subscribers, I think it's five, before they will actually activate any payouts so i would very much appreciate it if you've dropped support from me on patreon if you toddled on over to subscribe star and drop just a buck a month or or whatever in there in exchange for which you can suggest videos you can ask me about your your gaming issues from your tabletop game and you get access to discounts on my games literary works uh, apparel all that kind of jazz Groovy. Right, on with the video. Can you separate art from the artist? Now, there's a very obvious reason that this has been foremost in my thoughts uh, lately, but I have been planning to do uh, another video. I believe I've done one in the past on this. Planning to do it again. To kind of see if my thoughts have developed and to kind of lay out uh, what I think is a semi unique take. Uh, on this question, lots of people completely disown, get rid of, remove something that they have enjoyed up until that point on the basis of the, the views or whatever else of the artist that happened to have created it. Um, this is particularly true lately given all the revelations coming out of Hollywood and so on elsewhere. But art does exist independently of the artists, and while to an extent I can understand people wanting to remove support from current and ongoing decision making and individuals, so if a director is found to be a sex pest maybe you don't want to go and see one of their films because you don't want money going to them for their work there unless the company that they were previously working for somehow disconnects them from that yeah that makes sense when Orson Scott Card got in the news for his anti-homosexual opinions yeah it made sense that people didn't want to buy his books anymore, didn't want to go and see um, Ender's Game and so on because they were worried about money going to Orson Scott Card who was actively using that money to campaign against gay marriage and so on. That kind of makes sense. That has a meaningful impact on the world. But when we look at historical people, historical characters, there I think it takes on a, a, a different sense, a, a different tone, if you will. They're long dead. They can't hurt anybody anymore. There aren't, generally speaking, foundations set up in their name to continue their bigoted views from the days of yore. That doesn't tend to be something that happens. So in that case, I think there is absolutely no argument to be made for unpersoning the dead, for censoring the work of the dead. In fact, I think that their views are sometimes crystallized in their work is interesting. It gives you a window on the popular views of the time and in some cases why they were held. If you're a fan of Victorian science fiction, as I am, you will find a great deal of it to be racially and otherwise unsettling. There was a, a trend in sort of military science fiction fiction uh, around the turn of the century, that painting China as the enemy, as this faceless horde of disease carrying horrendous people. And that you know, there's a lot, also a great big theme of the, the unity of the Anglo-Saxon race against whatever else. Yeah, the stories are still good, but they're extremely unsettling to, to modern eyes to see these views being expressed. But they're still cracking good stories in spite of all that. And this isn't someone alive today espousing these views. So there, there's, there's that aspect. So there's people currently who hold obnoxious views that you don't want to fund. Fair enough. Uh, but there's people historically who held obnoxious views that were far more normal at their time and you don't hurt anyone or anything by liking that by by reading it by 
buying it. You know, that, that harms no one. And I think it's very important to preserve those things as historical documents, as eyes, a, a window into the past and how much we've improved, I think, and how bad things were. So that's kind of the, the artist side of it. Then there's the art side of it. There is a lot of historical work that is racist, sexist, uh, ableist, or whatever else. And I mean that in the proper sense of the word, not the kind of hypersensitive sense of the word. I have uh, an old school book uh, from the 1920s, a, a, a guide for children and their parents. And there's a whole chapter, this, this is a British textbook, espousing the, the virtues of selective breeding and um, sterilizing the, the mentally infirm and, and so on. So yeah, it, it's it's got a whole chapter on eugenics. This is pre-World War II. Yeah, that's, that's grotesque, but it's important to see and to understand it. And the modern works that obnoxious people have made can still be great pieces of art. Yet yeah, Mad Max isn't lessened for the fact that Mel Gibson has become a grotesque anti-Semite and lunatic. Now, this brings me to Lovecraft, who I'm going to use as my main example here. And this is where I'm going to bring in the spin that I think is something slightly different to what some people uh, have said, most people say about this kind of issue, whether one side or the other. Now, H.P. Lovecraft had uh, issues with women. Uh, you may notice they hardly figure in his stories at all, but they hardly figured in his life at all, except for his over overbearing aunt. He was also quite virulently racist, something that was very nicely satirized in Planetary, uh, where he presented these eggs of this mysterious creature to uh, Elijah Snow and the rest of the Planetary team, and proudly proclaimed them to be nigger eggs which is just kind of idiotic and stupid and satirizing his genuine and actual racism. Now, Lovecraft is a giant of horror and weird fiction. And, right, and here's the twist, here's the spin. I do not think that Lovecraft's work would have been half as evocative, half as good, if he hadn't been a xenophobic, racist piece of shit. I think that alienation, that fear of the other, that fear of the alien, comes from that, and from there permeates his work, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, sometimes just drawing upon that emotion of, of alienation and fear. And that is a big part of what makes his work so evocative, so powerful, so effective, and I think if he had been a, a more progressive integrationist, the kind of person we all probably would wish that he would be, I doubt he would have been such a good writer for what he did. So in that sense, we can't necessarily separate the art from the artist. And a lot of artists, a lot of writers, a lot of poets, a lot of painters are pieces of shit. They are horrible, egotistical, narcissistic maniacs. Now, there's only a correlation in mental health between depression and writers. I think that's because when your harshest critic is yourself, it's not quite so difficult necessarily to put things out. But even so, you can look at the, the big successful people in any sphere, not just art, and they're often a little bit unhinged or have weird views, or have weird lifestyles, you know, polygamous, or drug taking, or whatever else it might be. And I think that, unfortunately, informs a great deal of their work and is what makes it so effective. So the art can be appreciated and enjoyed separate from the artist, but the artist may not necessarily always be such an effective artist if they don't have a really strong sense of self, a really strong point of view, which is often toxic and nasty. So there's the filthy centrist view on this controversy. <laughs>
Sang. <laughs>